Greetings and welcome to church, to this service for Sunday the 27th of March here at Kohimarama Presbyterian Church. Thank you for engaging in worship uh, online uh, and uh, we welcome you and uh, appreciate your involvement uh, in this service. Uh, we start today with a call to worship uh, and uh, as we normally say the responses are printed and bold. Uh, the order of service is available online as well, uh, or uh, you may have picked up hard copies from the letterbox at church. I invite you to join and follow. O God, who makes all things new, new stars, new dust, new life, take my heart, every hardened edge and measured beat, and create something new in me. I need your newness, O God, the rough parts of me made smooth. The stagnant spirit, the stuck freed, the unkind forgiven. And then, by the power of your spirit, I need to be turned to the door I love again. Let's join together to sing, Here I Am to Worship. those who return here. For it is a love that has been waiting, like a candle in the window, ever lighting the way back, 
and never willing to let go the hope that each child will return home. Let it be the place where the only appropriate response is a love that has come to the end of its longing is to fill the fatted, kill the fatted calf, feast and celebrate, send up balloons and prepare a party for that which has been lost has returned to be among us once more. Let us pray. Loving God, we've known your welcome. We've experienced your outstretched arms. In this day, here and now, we pray that you will embrace us yet again. We open ourselves to you. We take time to know your unconditional love for us. And we are thankful. Be with us in this moment and in every moment, we pray. Amen. Our notices. Thank you, Richard. <coughs> so, a, a reminder that uh, if you're watching this online, you can access the full uh, order of service and the notices uh, on the website uh, with a click of your mouse, but otherwise you can pick up a hard copy uh, of the notices and service information from the letterbox of church. Uh, so, a summary of the notices, again, the full text is in that document. Firstly, there's a church working there coming up on Saturday the 2nd of April, uh, beginning at 9.30am, uh, and the big focus of that is getting the church and grounds spruced up uh, in preparation for the following weekend, which is the focus of our centennial celebration. And so, with respect to the centennial celebrations, uh, on the 8th, the, um, Friday the 8th, there's going to be a dinner at uh, the Terraces St Andrews Retirement Village on April 9th, Saturday at 2.30pm, a high tea uh, with a twist, and then the, the special service on the Sunday the 10th of April at 9.30. Uh, we are looking particularly for helpers who can assist with baking to provide food for the high tea, that's sweet and savoury item, so please contact the office if you can help, and a reminder that the closing date for the ticket sales for the dinner is the 1st of April, so that's Friday the 1st of April, you need to buy your tickets uh, by then. Uh, other notices, I think that was all, wasn't it? Um, but again, uh, pick up, up from the office or check out online. We are so grateful for the many gifts that everybody is giving and although we're apart we continue to give and we continue to give online, we continue to be able to give online um, for the food basket but a reminder that when we re-gather next week, so next week, um, the important thing to remember next week is that it's going to be a 9.30 service so um, we're clicking into the winter hours, 9.30 start um, and we also know that um, there's a real need for our food from the food basket, so we really make an extra plea at the moment to, um, to bring items of food for the food basket when we regather next Sunday. So, yeah, let's join to dedicate our offering. God, you call us to a ministry of reconciliation. You ask us to reach out to the world around us with your message of love and peace through Christ Jesus. Bless the gifts that we give for that work and grant that we may have the heart and mind of Christ. So with all our words, our thoughts and our actions, do what you and love have asked us to do to the glory of your name. Amen. And now it's our time with the children, which I have none with me, so it's kind of weird. So I'm going to pretend that the people here are younger than they are and I'm going to read them a story which um, I would still really like at my age, so I'm hoping that you'll like it too. It's called Katie and the Mona Lisa by James Mayhew. There's a few of these Katie books, um, and I'm a fan, so I'm going to read this one to you. Katie and her grandma often went to the gallery on their days out together. Grandma liked to tell Katie all about the famous paintings. Which picture do you like best? asked Grandma. Mona Lisa, said Katie. She smiled at me. She smiles at everyone, said Grandma. That's why she's famous. What makes her smile? asked Katie. I don't know, said Grandma, resting on a chair. Perhaps you should have a closer look at her. Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci, said Katie, reading the notice by the painting. 
I wish I knew what's making you smile. Then come inside, Bambina, said Mona Lisa. Katie was very surprised, but Grandma was dozing and the gallery was empty, so Katie climbed over the frame and inside the picture. Mona Lisa was sitting in a grand room with a balcony. Bambina, she said, how lovely to see you. I haven't had a visitor for hundreds of years. That's a long time, said Katie. Don't you get lonely? Yes, very, said Mona Lisa. I'm supposed to smile, but I don't feel very happy at all. Mona Lisa started to look sad. A small tear ran down her cheek and her smile disappeared. I'll cheer you up, said Katie, handing her a handkerchief. When Leonardo painted me here, he asked clowns and musicians to make me smile, said Mona Lisa, blowing her nose. Can you dance or sing? I've got a better idea, said Katie. She took Mona Lisa by the hand and very carefully they stepped out of the picture and into the gallery. You can meet anyone you like here, said Katie. I'm sure there's someone who can make you smile again. They looked at the pictures one by one. At last they stopped in front of St George and the Dragon by Raphael. A knight in shining armour, said Mona Lisa. Can I meet him? If we climb inside, said Katie. So Mona Lisa gathered up her long skirts and Katie took her through the frame. St George was rescuing a beautiful princess from a fire-breathing dragon. But he forgot all about her when he saw Mona Lisa. Ah, Bella, he said, climbing off his horse. He kissed Mona Lisa gallantly on the hand. At once the dragon ran off and started to chase the princess again. Mamma mia, said Mona Lisa. Help, save me, cried the princess. She leapt out of the picture with the dragon flying after her. Sir George grabbed his lance and dashed off to the rescue. Now I'm all alone again, sighed Mona Lisa. Perhaps we can try another picture, suggested Katie. They climbed out and walked into another room. Mona Lisa painted, pointed to a picture by Sandra Bonicelli called Primavera, which means spring. Look at the dancers, she said. I'd love to meet them. So Katie clambered inside and Mona Lisa followed her. Katie and Mona Lisa found themselves in an enchanted grove where everyone was dancing. The scent of flowers filled the air. Welcome to springtime, said a beautiful woman in a flowery dress. I'm Flora, come with me and taste the oranges. Flora helped Katie gather sweet juicy oranges from the trees while Mona Lisa joined in the dance. I think I could be happy if I stayed here, she said. But Katie slipped and fell onto the three dancers and they all ended up on the ground covered with squashed oranges. You've ruined the springtime dance. Just wait until we get our hands on you, said the dancers. Perhaps it's best, it's best if we don't stay, said Katie. I think you may be right, sighed Mona Lisa. They quickly climbed out of the picture and ran into another room before the three dancers could catch them. Mona Lisa saw a picture called The Lion of St Mark by Vittoria Carpaccio. She could see the city of Venice behind the lion. I've always wanted to visit Venice, sighed Mona Lisa. Katie thought it would be a good place to hide from the angry dancers, so she took Mona Lisa's hand and went through the frame and into the picture. The lion was very friendly. Welcome to Venice, he said. There's water everywhere, said Katie. Is there a flood? Venice was built on the sea, said the lion. I shall carry you over the water. They climbed on the lion's back and he opened his beautiful rainbow wings and flew up into the air. Below them, Venice sparkled like silver and gold. The lion carried them to the Grand Canal and they got into a boat called a gondola. The people of Venice waved and sang songs and gave them pasta and ice cream to eat. Katie wanted to have seconds of everything, but just then she saw that the gondola had sprung a leak. My dress will be ruined, cried Mona Lisa. What shall we do? I'll fly you back to the picture frame, said the lion. Climb on. They held onto the lion's mane and he flew up into the sky. I'm slipping off, yelled Katie, hanging on to the, one of the lion's wings. Oh dear, said the lion, I think I'm going to. Crash! They flew straight through the frame and fell into the gallery. Mamma mia, said Mona Lisa. And there in front of them sat the dragon. He puffed out cl clouds of smoke and roared at them. And behind the dragon stood St. George and the princess and the three dancers. They all looked very cross indeed. Oh dear, what a muddle, said Katie. What shall we do? Suddenly the gallery was filled with sweet music. It was coming from another picture called An Angel with a Lute, painted by a student of Leonardo da Vinci. The angel came out of his picture and stroked the dragon. He stopped growling, lay down and wagged his tail. How clever, said the princess, you've tamed him. The princess put her belt around his neck and led him proudly back to the picture. St George kissed Mona Lisa's hand once more and followed them. The angel played on and the three graceful dancers smiled and twirled and skipped happily back to the orange grove. The lion flew back to Venice, growling a farewell. Please, can you help Mona Lisa, said Katie to the angel. I wanted to make her smile, but everything went wrong. 
She doesn't need my help, said the angel. Just look. And Katie saw that Mona Lisa was smiling. Mamma mia, she said. What an adventure we've had, Bambina. Wasn't it fun? Yes, it was, said Katie. And they both laughed. Katie thanked the angel and watched him fly back into his painting. Will you be happy in your picture, Katie said to Mona Lisa. I shall think of you and that will make me laugh, she said, climbing through the frame. Thank you for making me smile again, Bambina. Adieu. Adieu, said Katie. Katie ran back to her grandma. I found out all about Mona Lisa's smile, said Katie, but I can't say because you wouldn't believe me. I expect you're right, said Grandma. Now, what would you like for supper? Pasta and ice cream, said Katie. They're my favourite. And she smiled a secret smile, just like Mona Lisa. I really like that story because I love the idea of climbing into a picture and exploring it from the inside. I want you to have a look at this picture up here and um, see if you can try climbing into that picture and what you find there. It's a pretty cool picture and it's of a parable that we're going to be reading soon. It's the parable of the prodigal son. And the thing I love about that picture is the dog. <laughs> and um, the dog jumping up to say, welcome home. And I think it's just an invitation to leap into that picture. And I love it if you would think about how you would jump into that picture and where you'd be in that picture, what you'd be thinking. I'd love to hear what you think about it. Let's join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're now going to have a God at Work slot, and we haven't had one of those for quite a while, and I was kind of limited in, in <laughs> who I could use, um, but I wasn't that desperate, <laughs> so I promise. Um, I, I've just been away, and um, while I was away, I found out, I was introduced to a new app on my phone, and um, it's, now I've forgotten what it's called, and I left my phone at home. Pray as you go. Pray as you go, thank you. So it's called Pray as you go, and it's this very cool Ignatian app that is a daily um, reading, and it's it's in the style of Ignatian um, and prayer, and so it, it, in, it starts with some bells ringing, and it has some music, and there's some scripture and a question to think about, and it's it's like between 10 and 13 minutes each morning, and it's, um, so if you're going for a walk or something like that, you could listen to it as you go for a quick walk, or if you're doing something first thing in the morning. And I was getting all excited about it, but here's me, you see, who gets excited about something like that, but it's, I got home, and, um, and I was playing it, and I had almost finished it, um, but I hadn't quite, and I needed to get ready to come into work, and so I came out to the living room, and it was still going, and Ben goes, is that pray as you go? And I'm like, yeah, and he goes, oh, I did that ages ago. <laughs> so I was just thinking about getting that out again. Which was really interesting, I was thinking, yeah, obviously I'm really slow on these things. So then I come to work, and I said to Margaret, hey, do you know about Pray As You Go? She goes, oh yeah, I did it about, how long ago? Like 10 years ago, or something ridiculous. <laughs> Which shows really how behind the times I am. But the really interesting thing is, come on up now, Margaret, now that I've made it an end of myself. Because Margaret said, I really enjoyed, you enjoyed Pray As You Go, didn't you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and you did it for quite, quite some time, and it's, I'm still going to enjoy it. But she was like, no, there's this other one. So what's the other one? Tell us. The other one is called Lectio 365. And again, it's about 10 minutes, and it's focused on four words that guide you through the process. They pray. So pray is for pause. R is for reflect. Read, read a psalm and reflect on the scripture. A is ask, and Y is yield. So um, it's just a lovely, lovely process to go through. Um, and it has a morning and an evening option, but you're suggesting starting with the morning? Yes, go with the morning one. I, um, I love the way it starts because one of the things that I grapple with constantly is distraction. 
I find it very hard to focus. And so, because I've forgotten it already, I've got my phone here that will give the first words. As I enter prayer now, I pause to be still, to breathe slowly, to recenter my scattered senses upon the presence of God. And um, there we are. Isn't that cool? So, you know, I think we forget how many resources that we have at our fingertips. You know, by having a phone, we have these amazing resources that are just right there for us. So whether you want to have a go at Pray As You Go, whether you want to have a go at Lectio 365, um, there are so many resources. And I would really challenge you, we're in the season of Lent, to take on new spiritual disciplines. It's not too late to start a new one. And um, have a go. Try them out and see what you think. And we'd love to hear about it. Eh? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. We're now going to take a moment um, to reflect on our, our PowerPoint psalm, Psalm 32. Enjoy. son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, 
and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. God is still speaking. We are still speaking. Thank you, Dean. Let's join together in our prayers of confession. Holy God, we have headed off to a far country in so many ways. It may not be a physical distance we have chosen, but a distance emotionally or a distance in our minds. A simple step away from you instead of toward you. And in that step, the rift opens as we demand our share as we choose the way of resentment or the way of judgment, refusing to join the feast you place before us because of those we don't want to sit beside. And now we recite the words we know we need to say, acknowledging the ways we've stepped away from you, the far country we have chosen instead, with each bitter thought, each joyless rejection, each selfish request. Forgive us, holy God and run toward us with open arms. Amen. Even as the son had not finished his practiced words that owned his wrong choices, the father interrupts in forgiveness with open arms. Even in the incompleteness of our confession, God interrupts us with forgiving celebration. Bring quickly the best clothes and put on a signet ring on his finger, shoes on his feet and kill the fattened calf and let us eat and celebrate for this is my child who is dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. My friends, welcome home. This man Jesus and his remarkable household 
welcome sinners and even eats with the likes of us. Thanks be to God. Let's join to sin. Lord, I come to you. to come home and it made me think again of that painting of the prodigal son the welcome of scamper was so complete there was no reservation no sense of why have you been away just joy at my return reminds me of the father in the story a story only told in luke the father who longs for his child's return and when it happens runs out in utter joy-filled welcome. He reminds his son that this is indeed where he belongs and nothing he does will change that reality. There is a place where we belong, a place we can call home, and that place is where faith holds us, where grace renews us, 
and where forgiveness longs for us to be the people God wills us to be. A place where we are accepted, taken in and loved unconditionally, where we can ask questions and share our uncomfortable feelings, where our pain is held and we are known by name. It's the place we return to when we come to ourselves, when we wake up and realise who we want to be, where we can become our best selves. Not in some imaginary ideal, but in the ordinariness of everyday life. Now, I know that this place is still broken. We still fail to offer that reality. We forget someone's name. We turn away from their pain. We put limits on our living. That's the reality of the kingdom that we pray to come more fully because it's not yet fully realised. But in this place, we get to glimpse something of that kingdom reality. We're being formed into a community where the table is wide and all can be welcomed, all can find a place where they belong. Where we are loved into a better way of behaving. Where we are accompanied by others who also seek this kingdom way. And we become willing to open ourselves to each other as well as to God and become formed as the children of God. This place that we return to, where we know we belong, is not a particular building, but rather a community, a community held together by love. And like the parable, we will not all get it right. While the father opens his arms and welcome, the brother may need to do some more work on himself. The wayward one, must heed the welcome of the father in spite of the brother's judgment. But this community is called to be a place of homecoming, where people are welcomed home no matter how far away they have been. This is a story of many roles, and at different stages in our lives we may find ourselves in any one of the player's shoes. I know I've walked in all their shoes, the wayward, the welcomer, the judge. It's the heartbreaking story of the church. So I invite you to take a moment to recognise the times that you have walked in their shoes. Think for a moment about the wayward son. Think about the times you've chosen to be a long way up from God when you've travelled to a far country. Think of the way that you have been the elder brother, more concerned about comparison and judgement and forgiveness and welcome. Think about the times you have watched from a distance and wondered if you should have got involved. Think about the times that you have run out to celebrate and welcome. And now I want us to enter another painting of the prodigal son's story. This time the more famous one by Rembrandt. It is a large painting, oil on canvas, really, really big. If you were looking at me, I would be holding my hands up really big to show you quite how big it is. 262 by 205 centimetres. That's like really tall like Richard and quite wide. So it's a big painting on display at the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. Rembrandt lived an eventful life in the 1600s in the Netherlands. Although influenced a lot by Italian artists, he never travelled. After he achieved youthful success as a portrait painter, Rembrandt's later years were marked by personal tragedy and financial hardship. Three of his children died in childhood and his wife died at the age of 32. So let's take some time to look at the painting and see where we are in the story. Notice who is present and how they are present. Look at the way they are holding themselves. Notice where Rembrandt has placed the light and where there are the shadows. Rembrandt painted this when he was an old man and it speaks of both his maturity as a painter but also as a child of God. The painting includes six figures. Look closely, there is another female figure at the back left. Take a look at them and see who they are. The prodigal son is in the foreground on his knees. He and the father are depicted in the light whilst the other figures are in the shadow. 
Then look at where our eyes tend to first be drawn, where the light is greatest. Notice the way the Father has enveloped the Son in his embrace. The Son leans into his Father as the Father bends towards the Son. It is a symbol of all homecomings. Then notice the hands, how different one hand is from the other. Rembrandt chose to paint a masculine hand and a feminine hand. Take some time to ponder why he might have done this. Then look closer at the face of the father. See the impact that all this has had on him. Having lost his beloved child, we see it in his face. The father's face is a bit pale and his cheeks appear a bit hollow, the effects of worrying for years about his missing son. And his face shows multiple emotions at the same time. Grief of his son's past behaviour, relief at his son's back, and love in being able to embrace his son. And then as we drop our eyes, we come to the feet of the prodigal son. Where have those feet walked? The shoes now falling off his feet, worn and tattered, perhaps like the rest of this young man. Tired, weary, and footsore. And then we look further and see the figure on the right of the painting. Hands tightly clutched, looking down with a frown, a stance of judgment. Here is the one who's not made many mistakes yet and has been following God. But here in his stance, we see something of his struggle with the idea that his father was willing to forgive the mistakes of his brother. His struggle with the attitudes of his father and brother and whether he can put his jealousy aside and also choose the way of forgiveness. In the actual story, the brother is not present at this reunion. Rembrandt chooses to combine the two encounters, the welcome and the second offer of welcome. One received and one, at least in this moment, not received. Like last week, we're not told the end of the story. But there are a couple of other things I want to say about the story. The first is about the response to this artwork by the Dutch priest, Henry Nouwen, who died in 1996. He was so taken with the painting that he wrote a short book using the painting as a way through the parable. And if you want to get a copy of it, Margaret too, he's got a copy. He writes in this book of his visit to the State Hermitage Museum in 1986, where he was able to contemplate the painting alone for hours. Considering the role of the father and sons in the parable in relation to Rembrandt's biography, he then writes, Rembrandt is as much the elder son of the parable as he is the younger. When during the last years of his life he painted both sons in return of the prodigal son, he had lived a life in which neither the lostness of the younger son nor the lostness of the elder son was alien to him. Both needed healing and forgiveness. Both needed to come home. Both needed the embrace of a forgiving father. But from the story itself, as well as from Rembrandt's painting, it is clear that the hardest conversion to go through is the conversion of the one who stayed home. And that leads me to the way this parable has been playing out in my head and heart this week. I have pondered a lot on what might have happened if the older brother had been the one at the gate when the prodigal son returned. What that kind of conversation would have done to his vulnerable returning heart. How tragic it would have been if the brother had had the final say. And I've reflected on the importance of the father rushing out to meet the wayward son, to be the one there first who could offer forgiveness and welcome. Because soon enough, the brothers would meet. Soon enough, there would be unhelpful words, perhaps words that would sting. And then it would be the welcome of the father that would need to be enough. Enough for the sinner to stay. Enough for him to know that he belongs. And I've reflected on the way our gracious God has met me time and time again at the gate before I've had to deal with the judgment of others. 
when God's welcoming call has been enough to say I belong amidst the times when as a woman in ministry I've been unwelcome. And I pray that this is the experience of others too. That our folly of judgment will be overwhelmed by the gracious welcome of God. And I pray that I have not been and will not be at the gate unless I've been able to offer the welcome of the Father. I realise that this has been very much a pondering, wondering kind of sermon. An invitation for you to enter the story in real honesty and grapple with what you might find there. An invitation for you to let God touch you where you most need to be touched. Godly Play offers us wondering questions about this parable, which might also help. Let me read some of those before we conclude. I wonder where this farm really is. I wonder if you have ever been near a place like this. I wonder why the younger brother wanted to leave the family home. I wonder why the father gave him his money and let him go. I wonder if you have ever wanted to run away from somewhere. I wonder if you have ever had to let someone you loved go away. I wonder if that city has got a name. I wonder if you've ever been near a place like that. I wonder where the pigsty really is. I wonder if you've ever wished you were somewhere else. I wonder if you've ever run away and then come home again and be welcomed like that. I wonder if you've ever felt like the older brother. I wonder what the older brother did next. I wonder where home really is. Whatever far country we have run to, we are welcomed home. Whatever preconceived ideas we have of who deserves what, all are welcomed home. God leads the way in welcome. So be it. Amen. Let's join to sin. Brother, sister, let me serve you.
John to come and lead us in our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are the God that can do all things. You reign over all. Power and might are in your hands. Compassionate God, you hear the cries of all who suffer. We pray for those who perpetrate violence and suffering, including the President of Russia. We pray that he may be turned around, transformed, and work for the healing in Ukraine. We give thanks for the generosity of so many who are opening their hearts and homes to the refugees. We pray for all the families in Poland and Romania who show us the best of humanity. We thank you for the people of Poland and other nations who are opening their hearts and homes to the refugees. God be with all who work for peace. Be with those closer at home. Those we know who are fearful, those who are sick, suffering or dying, that each one may feel your comfort and peace. And as we listen for your prompts, moment by moment, teach us to recognize your accent, just like Jesus did. Through Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. Thank you, John. I love that, to recognise the accent of God. Let's join together in our final hymn, Love Divine.
get ready to go well. On the good days, give thanks to God. In your bad days, give thanks to God. Neither think too highly of your achievements, nor put yourself down as useless. You are a child of God, sufficiently beautiful and sufficiently flawed to warrant the costly grace of the crucified Lord that welcomes you home. Go your way with a resilient and cheerful spirit, seeking to continue to grow in the faith to which you have been called. And may the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit watch over you while we are absent from one another until we return. Amen. Thank you.